Um, superb. Um, so um, as always, um, delighted, uh, delighted to be here. I'm, I'm glad that the hailstones that Adele was talking about have passed. I were here a while ago. I could barely hear myself talk. So um, if you if you uh, encounter some unusual interference, it's likely to be our hailstones. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about um, data today. I want to kind of remind you a little bit about the other stuff that's going on as well as this program. Um, just um, we were on calls earlier in the week with colleagues and, and one of the big strengths of both the suicide prevention program and the other bits of work going on is how we can kind of link them up. So um, linking them up um, is important. So I'll do a bit of a bit of a reminder then. And uh, Tom, that was really um, that was really kind of big billing before I came on. So I'll, I'll do my best to say something interesting. Um, the data on suicide, now you guys have seen this before, but it's really important because it's the ONS data on suicide in um, England and Wales. And at the moment, it's still the best data we have um, to tell us what happened early on um, in the pandemic. So April to July 2020, rates of suicide uh, in that period in 2020 compared with previous years. And when we're looking at all, the all person suicide rate, what we see is the suicide rate in those months of 2020 was lower. Um, so the pandemic wasn't associated with a rise in suicide rates, it was associated with a fall. The falls in suicide rates were particularly evident in men um, and they were particularly evident in younger people. Um, and actually, um, they weren't that evident in, in older adults, uh, which is, I think, relevant to Adele's presentation. And for women over 75, there may have been an increase. It wasn't, didn't reach statistical significance in the ONS analysis, but um, important um, to remember that, um, you know, the effects may be different by age group. Um, but of course, that's um, a first bit of the pandemic, what's been happening since. So. Um, the, the more, if you like, up to date ONS data is um, based on date of registration. Um, so uh, what you need to bear in mind here is um, uh, that these are the dates when uh, deaths are registered, not when they occurred. So for many of the 2021 deaths, uh, you know, many of them will have occurred in 2020. But what we're seeing, you know, based on the latest registration data is, you know, again, um, no um, evidence of a uh, of an increase, which is, you know, in some ways reassuring. We have to bear in mind, of course, that 2018, 2019, the rates have been kind of higher than in previous years. So, you know, the suicide prevention task is still very much um, a priority, but not not seeing um, any uh, rise in the latest ONS data. Uh, the eagle-eyed amongst you, these are quarterly rates of suicide. So you, you might be looking at 2020 and saying, well, hang on, what's happened in the last quarter there? Remember, these are the dates when deaths are registered and in the early part of a the pandemic there um, in the second quarter, fewer deaths were registered for uh, obvious reasons, you know, difficulties in actually kind of registering deaths or death registration processes. And, and probably some of this represents catch up. But overall, the message from the ONS data is uh, uh, no increase. Um, and it's a similar message. You know, you've heard me talk about the real time data and really, if you like, one of the massively pleasing things about the QI program is how, if you like, the program, the QI program, the activity that all of you guys have been involved in has then kind of fed into the national effort, particularly when it comes to real time surveillance. So this is work uh, led by by Lewis. Lewis Appleby often comes to kind of talk to you all. What does it show? Again, uh, no um, increase in suicide. You get these kind of fluctuations. This is data going up to spring of 2021. We've actually got data now going up to the autumn of 2021, um, which you know, shows a similar pattern so far in the data that we've got. Uh, no uh, increase. What we're planning to do is try and disentangle that. So look at um, uh, rates by um, age. Um, rates by um, sex as well, just to, because because of those some of those things where you get might get differential effects by subgroup. Um, so that's some of the suicide data. Um, you've heard me talk at previous meetings about the data on self harm, and and really when we're thinking about the data on self harm, there's there's both the self harm um, people who self harm who present to services, maybe present to primary care uh, or emergency departments, and self harm that occurs in the community. 
you know, the picture for people um, who harm themselves in the community hasn't really changed. That's been monitored through the UCL social uh, social survey, and that's remained fairly constant uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, really. The help seeking, the people that actually seek help from primary care or secondary care, again, quite a consistent pattern in that we've seen reductions in help seeking, so reductions in rates of people with self-harm presenting to emergency departments or primary care, especially during the first lockdown, but also in subsequent lockdowns. So this idea of reduced, um, possibly reduced help seeking for self-harm from the emergency department data. What we've not explored or seen a lot of is, um, you know, any papers thinking about how services are managing self-harm and whether that's changed. But um, this is a, a paper published by my colleague Sarah Steeg in Manchester that I think is really interesting. It looks at primary care management for self-harm. So this is primary care um, people who are known to have um, self-harm based on their clinical records. Um, CPRD, so a big, big data set. Um, so what did she find? So this compares um, management of people with self-harm during the pandemic versus management of people um, in the four months, uh, in the equivalent four month period pre-pandemic. And um, what you see, so this, the line, the red line there is the line of equivalence. So basically um, pre-pandemic um, people um, in the three months after self-harm, people were just as likely to consult a GP or practice nurse after self-harm than they were before. So there's no change in overall consultation for self-harm um, after self-harm um, during the pandemic or afterwards. But unsurprisingly, um, there was a bit of a switch in the mode of that uh, uh, consultation. So fewer face-to-face, -face, about 40% fewer uh, a 40 percent reduction in the um, in the likelihood of a face to face consultation, but uh, nearly a twofold increase in um, people consulting remotely uh, after after self harm. No changes in the proportion of people with self harm receiving uh, medication um, after afterwards within primary care, but quite a marked reduction, about a 40 percent reduction in people being referred to mental health services. So during the first four months of the pandemic, people were less likely to be referred from primary care after self-harm than they were pre-pandemic. So that's, that's quite important. What was even more interesting though, um, is when, um, when Sarah and colleagues, um, and we were also authors on this paper, looked at some of the subgroups, and looked at some of the age and deprivation subgroups. So one really interesting thing was about this kind of remote consultation. Lots of people have been talking about um, digital exclusion, but there wasn't any evidence of exclusion um, because of this switch to remote um, consulting. So um, older people were just as likely to consult remotely as younger people. Um, people in the most deprived areas um, were um, as likely to consult kind of remotely. So there wasn't this um, exclusion effect. But bear in mind this consulting remotely, actually this wasn't all digital. The majority of the remote consultations were phone consultations, but in some ways reassuring that, that the change um, to um, service provision, um, and remember this is specifically after self-harm, didn't exclude people. People were still um, consulting just as much um, as they were before. For younger people, although overall there wasn't a, a change in the uh, medication, uh, the likelihood of being prescribed medication, 10 to 24 year olds were about 20% um, more likely to be prescribed medication during the pandemic phase compared to an equivalent period um, uh, before pre-pandemic. Um, so that was that was interesting. So that, that's an unexplained increase in uh, medication after self-harm for young people. Um, and interestingly, this uh, decrease in referral to mental health services, people over 65 didn't see um, that reduction. So they were just as likely to be referred um, before and during the pandemic. So in really interesting data from Sarah and colleagues there, um, looking at changes in management for self-harm. And, you know, um, I think that's, that's among some of the first data that we've got in that area. Now, yeah, the, the problem with um, using news um, clippings, which are kind of often in my slides, is, is they very soon kind of become kind of out of date. So, you know, this was 
these were some of the headlines kind of earlier in the week. It was about the end of COVID rules and obviously events uh, overseas have, you know, overtaken all of that. But but this was about, you know, COVID and, and you know, this, this idea that restrictions were over, you know, is it all over um, in terms of the mental health effects, in terms of the effects of suicide and self-harm? Of course it isn't. Uh, I think the, the effects of some of this uh, is going to play out. And I just wanted to tackle one or two areas and what we know about them. One of the things that people have been talking quite a lot about, obviously, is long COVID. So what's the um, what's the evidence about long COVID um, and the potential impact on suicide rates? So there, there isn't data on long COVID, but even early on, uh, there was this idea that um, after you'd have been infected with COVID-19, you were at increased risk of mental health disorders. And this was a, an earlier study based on an American data set where people looked at the likelihood, it was a records-based study of getting psychiatric illness. Um, and after a COVID-19 diagnosis, people um, you know, um, got uh, unwell um, over time, you know, up to kind of 20% of people during the follow-up period. It's just a survival bar. And that was a, a, an increased level and an increased rate than people, a comparison group with influenza. So this idea that COVID-19 might be associated, getting COVID-19 might be associated with getting psychiatric illness. And then by extension, obviously, you know, that's a group we're going to be worried about in terms of self-harm um, and suicide. But it's not quite as simple as that. It's not quite as simple as that. So this is a, a study led by um, colleagues, Catherine Abel and Matthias Pierce in Manchester. Really interesting study where they did a similar kind of thing, but based on um, primary care data from the UK. And what they found is if people tested positive for COVID, um, they were about twice the risk of getting um, psychiatric morbidity, psychological symptoms in the follow up period. So people got a positive COVID test twice as likely as people in the general population to subsequently develop psychiatric morbidity. But the really kind of quite intriguing thing was the increased risk of psychiatric morbidity. So increased risk of psychological um, um, problems was almost as high in people that had a PCR test but tested negative. So really quite an intriguing kind of result that, yep, you know, if you got COVID, you um, had an increased risk of um, psychiatric morbidity. But actually, if you had a test, and this was when it wasn't mass testing, it was early on in the pandemic, you had a test and tested negative, you were still at increased risk. And um, th th this, is, this is some Korean data, which takes it kind of even further. And it's, it's Korean data, it's um, self-injurious behaviour is, is what they've called it. But again, this is more kind of food for thought, really. Um, you know, we're not sure how applicable this will be to UK services. But what I've looked at here is um, uh, people with um, uh, people with uh, who who didn't get tested, who tested positive for COVID nineteen, and who tested negative, um, and they've looked at the rate of self interest behaviour, so the rate of self harm, and so the rate of self harm in people who've um, been tested remains fairly flat. The rate of people who tested positive for COVID-19, and again, remember this is early on, actually fell during the early part of the pandemic. But the rate in people who tested negative actually kind of increased. So, you know, similar in, in some ways kind of extends um, uh, Catherine and Matthias's uh, uh, findings a little bit, but quite an intriguing result. So that the, I think the relationship between um, mental health and COVID um, a suicide risk and actually getting COVID, self-harm risk and actually getting COVID is, is, is a kind of complicated one and we need to see how this thing plays out. The other thing, of course, we need to be mindful of you know, how, how things play out is you know, some of these other factors related to COVID. So back in the, in the first uh, phase, you remember we were worried about the fall off in GDP, the huge fall off in GDP. Back in 2021, you know, there was, there was we were worried about, you know, how many job falls would we actually see? What would unemployment be like? And obviously the 2022 concern is um, the cost of living squeeze. Um, and I think two things to say about that. The first is, you know, that means that we need to continue to be mindful of monitoring suicide and self-harm. That's absolutely really important. But the other thing is, as we go on, 
you know, some of this isn't going to be attributable to COVID directly. I mean, the you know, cost of living crisis, there's, there's things going on at the moment that in some sense have nothing to do with COVID that are going to be contributing to that. So as we move forward, some of the changes, some of the pressures we see on suicide and self-harm rates um, are going to be nothing to do with COVID, but really, really important that we carry on monitoring it. Talk to you about some data and research. Just wanted to remind you now about some of the, you know, the activity that's going on in the area. So everyone here involved in the suicide prevention program, you know, been a real privilege to be involved in this uh, from the very beginning. All uh, four waves on on board now. Three priority areas. Lots of brilliant activity and you know enthusiasm that kind of blows me away. So it, it's fantastic to be involved. But that's the project we're involved, the program we're involved in. But I know many of you are aware of these, but just, just to kind of um, highlight um, for you, NHS England have also asked us to be to help areas develop community services for self-harm. So this is part of the community transformation work. It's particularly focused on the community offer for, um, for people who self-harm across areas. We had 12 early implementer sites who we worked with to develop plans for self-harm. Uh, we've just started uh, with the remaining um, 30 sites. We've had a couple of really fantastic events um, this week. Um, but just, you know, making sure that people involved in the Community Services for Self-Harm program know about all the self-harm work that's going on as part of the Suicide Prevention program is really important. And it's important for people on the call here to know that there will be activity for self-harm going on locally. And if you don't know already to link with the key person, in many in many uh, instances, it's the same people. The other thing that's coming is a sequin. For those of you who don't know, sequins are, uh, if you like, kind of targets for health services that come with a little bit of additional money. And after many years of trying, I'm, I'm delighted to say we've got one for self-harm. So this is really to incentivize services to uh, make sure that everyone gets an assessment after uh, after self-harm. It, it's slightly more complicated than that in terms of the, the sequin, but I won't go into that today. But, you know, again, we're supporting services um, to try and think how they um, assess as many people as possible and how the assessments they give are, you know, as good as they can possibly be, as uh, compliant with the nice guidelines as they can possibly um, be. So we've had a we've had an initial event which is on the on the web somewhere. Um, we're going to have further, further kind of online events with different areas. But again, if you haven't linked with the person who's um, leading on the sequence for self harm in your area, please do. And that's coming on stream um, in April uh, uh, in April 2022. As usual, hopefully all the slides will have uh, links on them so you can click on to the relevant bits. Um, the last couple of things I just want to talk about are, are wider things. So um, the guidelines, the uh, uh, NICE self-harm guidelines. I've been involved in NICE guidelines self-harm since 2004. Someone kindly reminded me in the, earlier this week. Uh, this is the latest iteration. Uh, I was uh, had the privilege of being the topic advisor on the new NICE guideline. Uh, you've still got a chance to register as a stakeholder and comment by the 1st of March if you if you haven't already. One of the things we've tried to push in the latest guideline is, is this idea that, you know, uh, people should have some expertise in dealing with self-harm no matter where people present, you know, be it education, be it emergency departments, be it um, ambulance service. So this idea of, you know, everyone having a role to play, uh, but please give us your comments because that um, helps us to uh, improve the guideline. And online safety is a is a constant, uh, is a constant kind of, uh, um, you know, is a const it's constantly in our thoughts. Um, you all, I think, be aware of the online safety bill. Um, there's obviously kind of suicide specific measures in there. Uh, the Samaritans uh, published a report um, early uh, this month uh, wondering about, you know, where which areas we might go further in in order to make it uh, make the Internet kind of a, a, a safer place. And that's well worth uh, well worth a look at if you get a chance. Very good. And the last thing, as usual, is just all our hardworking staff back at um, back at base and, and I'm hoping we're going to have a be able to take a kind of updated uh, picture soon because I know a lot of you have been seeing this for quite a while. Thank you very much.
Sorry, it took me a minute to get off mute. Uh, Nav, um, you lived up to the billing, I think. That was really fascinating, and thank you for the particularly the updated data, but also linking together that other work. Um, are there, we've got a bit of time for questions, so really please see any questions for Nav, or be, uh, if anyone, or comments. Would like to. Someone said it's a sequin um, adults only. I believe it's all a. It, I believe it's consistent with the nice guidelines. So it's kind of all ages, but you know eight plus. But um, uh, you might need to check the uh, the sequin website to make sure that I'm not speaking out of turn. But I've, I'm pretty sure it's kids as well. Thank you, Nav. That's a big deal, isn't it? That sequin. I, I think it is, and you know, it's um, it, it's not perfect because while we've got a bit of time, I can go into a bit more detail. So, the ideal sequin would be of the people who present with self harm to emergency departments, how many get assessed? Because we want that to be 100%. We recognise it can't be. The difficulty with having a sequin that goes between emergency department services and um, mental health services is it's kind of complex. I who does the money kind of go to. It's also quite difficult to measure. We don't really have the measurement systems in place. So what the sequence ended up being is of the people who are referred to mental health services in general hospitals, primarily liaison psychiatry services, how many of them get a kind of nice uh, quality assessment? And we're encouraging sites to do a kind of self audit of a of 100 nodes. So it's not an ideal sequin, but the fact we've got a sequin in that area, the fact we've got a sequin um, uh, for self-harm assessment, I, I think is really positive. Um, you know, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it's going to be self-report, it's going to be self-audit, you know, surely people will be able to game it. Um, that, that, that I think NHS England recognised people will be able to game it, but that's not in the spirit of this. The spirit of this is improving the care we're all providing. So um, hopefully, yeah, we're we're really pleased that there's a sequence. Thanks, Nav. Uh, Richard, please. Hi, Nav. Um, just Hello. On, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, just on that last point about the sequin, and um, sorry, I came into this late. Um, and those that are referred to the probably MHLTs, um, is there pre presumably there's some detail about the nature of the assessment that's undertaken rather than just because I guess everyone, if they've been referred, will have some degree of an assessment, but it's about the quality of the assessment and the outcome, isn't it? Absolutely. And and the reason I waved so enthusiastic to, uh, enthusiastically, Richard, is is you might think I'm just being strange, but uh, Richard and I are old, old friends. We trained, we trained together. So excuse my slightly enthusiastic uh, <laughs> outburst there. Um, no, you're quite right, Richard. So one of the things we've done is uh, NHS England have asked us to kind of come up with, you know, what does an assessment look like? So we've got this, we've got this audit tool that should be either on the website or will be on the website. And the idea will be that um, I, I think it probably, I mean, in some areas it might be information people, but the idea would be, it would be probably one of the clinical team that would pull a hundred set of uh, every quarter, I think it is, um, you, you'll need to look at the detail, will pull the re records and we'll use the audit tool as a kind of guide to say, well, look, did, th is there evidence that this was kind of collaborative? And obviously some of these things are really difficult to kind of determine from case records. Um, is there evidence that, you know, they asked about alcohol? Is there evidence that, you know, there's a management plan in place? You know, um, you know, did they do something we don't recommend, which is use <coughs> risk assessment tools to score people? So there's this checklist. And one of the tricky things is that when we had the launch meeting for the sequin, you know, that this isn't a rigid kind of audit tool. So it isn't, you're not supposed to kind of score it and say, you know, oh, um, no, they haven't quite got this area. It's, it's it's really a guide. And in the end, you know, it's the clinician reviewing the notes that will say, yeah, to me, that sounds like it was, you know, in the spirit of the NICE guidelines, it was NICE compliant. Yeah. And actually, we find that, you know, 82 out of 100 are, uh, which is fantastic, and you'll get your sequin money. But I think what we're really, really wanting is to use this as a basis of quality improvement. So you guys will look at your case notes, you'll say, yeah, look, you know, we're, we're nice compliant, but actually we're, we're not really, I think, you know, um, thinking about how things might feed into uh, risk management plans. So we're not really thinking 
about how collaborative our assessments might be. Are we, you know, and, and it might just be it isn't being recorded in the notes, but what we'll do as a local quality improvement exercise, make sure that staff got the message around that, see what we can do around that. So really the, the value of this is, I mean, I'm, I hope the NHS England team won't, won't kind of um, be cross with me, but it isn't about just, just meeting the sequence, it's about using it as a uh, lever, if you like, for local quality improvement. Because, you know, we, I know liaison psychiatry colleagues very well across the country and, you know, most of them just, just want to make things better for the patients and hopefully this will help. That's great. Thank you. Uh, enthusiasm is fine enough as well to anyone who's asking the question. But, uh, no, it's really interesting. The sequin can be like a, it's a blunt tool, isn't it, in itself, but it's, um, but it, if used, in a particular way can lead to really good improvements. Um, Susan Pritchard's asked if, if there's a link to the audit tool. Um, I think you said it's either on the website or going to be on the website. So I don't it's know. either on the website or going to be on the website. And on the um, sequin, what happens with the slides afterwards, Tom? Do we put them up or do we put yeah, them Yeah, yeah, we put them on the website, yeah. Um, there should be a link to the sequin um, underneath. You know where I've got the sequin? It should be a link to the sequin page. Um, and the audit tool will end up on the website if it isn't already. Great, thank you. So I think uh, we'll make sure that link's available on the website as well. And I think Sue Wells oh, just Sue about Wells to put there. the link in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there Sue it is, yeah. Um, kind of all, as always on the ball. Yeah, fantastic. OK, so I just check if there's any other questions for Nav, if there are any other questions for Nav before we move on. No, well, thank you so much, as ever, Nav. That was great and uh, really good promising news about various developments. Um, so